let's look here at, Gal at Galatians chapter 4. And you see there uh, in your, your notes, the sermon is entitled, What It Means to Be Adopted by God. And there's kind of a, a subtitle there that I, I didn't want to intimidate you by putting it in the notes there. But this, the subtitle is the indicatives, the imperatives and implications of Scripture's teaching on adoption. You say, well, what does that mean? Uh, that word indicative, if you remember from your uh, language classes, it's, it's a, a word that means a, a statement of fact. And here it means the, a statement of something that God has done. An imperative is an instruction. So I I give us a, a command that's that's an imperative. An implication is a conclusion based upon other things. So we're, we're talking here about some statements of fact. So if I were to say to my child, you are my child, that's, that's an indicative. It's a statement of fact. And then I were to say, clean your room, that's an imperative. And if they did indeed clean their room, that would be an implication. That would be what they do as a result of who they are and and me giving this imperative on the basis of who they are. Now, if I just walked around Tazewell County saying, clean your room, or what are you doing? Is your room clean yet? That would be kind of a silly thing to do if there wasn't a relationship, that those indicatives, those, those statements of fact about a relationship didn't exist first. So we're going to talk about the statements of fact here in Scripture about who we are in Christ. We talked about that last week, and, and this week we're going to talk about who we are in Christ as adopted children. And the basis of understanding who we are in Christ as his adopted children, we'll talk about what, we would, what God would have us do, what commands he would give us, and how we live in obedience to that. But we're here in Galatians chapter 4, and if you would stand with me in honor of God as we begin to read this section of Scripture together. Reading from the English Standard Version, here's what Paul writes. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You may be seated. May God encourage your hearts as we read his word together, and may God be preparing all of our hearts to partake of communion together here at the end of our, our time looking at his word. Let's pray. Father, we would ask for your grace on us this morning. Help us to think rightly about who you are, and to think rightly about who we are in relationship to who you are. We pray that our, our hearts would be sensitive to your teaching. We pray that whatever is going on in, in our lives outside of this room, that you would allow us to uh, have our minds set upon you, and to think very carefully about your love for us, and to rejoice in that, to, to settle our hearts and convict us of the areas in which we need to change by your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The sermon this morning is not about our adoption of children. We're going to talk a little bit about adoption of children, but the sermon isn't foundationally about our adoption of children the sermon this morning is about our adoption by God. We're going to talk this morning about this, this truth that you and I have been adopted by God and how that truth affects how we adopt children or how we do anything in obedience to God, how we adopt children or how we go into the mission field or how we serve in, in children's ministry or how we love our, our parents and honor them or how we love our spouse, how we do anything in obedience to God. What we're going to see this morning is, is foundationally we need to understand who we are 
in Christ as God's adopted children. This has huge implication. This, this indicative, this statement of fact about what God has done to adopt us helps us understand how we can do anything in obedience to God, including adopting children or all those other things we might mention. But we are going to talk about our adoption of children because I think it's a good illustration of why it's so important for us to understand that we've been adopted by God. And, and maybe you've, you've heard me share this story before, but I'm going to share just a little bit of it again about how we began our adoption ministry here at Bethany Community Church. And really, we began our adoption ministry here at Bethany Community uh, many years ago at Bethany Baptist Church. They're the ones who kind of helped us begin this, this ministry as they planted us. We kind of adopted the ministry, so to speak, that they had already begun. Uh, and that began uh, some 13 or 14 years ago. I was the family pastor there at Bethany Baptist Church, and some families came to me, and they were involved in adopting. They were involved in fostering. They said, look, uh, Daniel, this is uh, what's going on in the life of our family. We need the church to come alongside us and help us think rightly about what's going on. We need some, some people to, to love on us and to care for us. And we said, that sounds, that sounds great. And so we began to, to meet together and to think about what God's word said concerning adoption. And we saw that God in his word is very, very, uh, very, n he notices the, those who are disenfranchised. He notices the, this is the orphan, the fatherless. He notices the widow. He notices the poor, the foreigner. And God would have his people think about the widow, the fatherless, the foreigner, the, the poor as well. And we asked the question, well, well, why is that? And so we looked at Scripture and we saw that God had adopted us. And we saw that as a template for our understanding of how to care for the fathers. We saw that we were lost, that God in his great love initiated love toward us, that God, through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for our sin and brought us into relationship with him by his grace through our placing our faith in his son, Jesus Christ, alone for our salvation. And we saw that as that took place, God brings us into adoption as, as part of his family. And we said, okay, if, if that's true, then how would God have us respond? And we saw in scripture that God would have his people emulate him, imitate him. So we, we thought through all these things. Again, this was 13, 14 years ago or so. And then we thought through the, the practical, okay, if this is, this is the, the theological, the biblical truth about our adoption by God and, and how he would have us respond. Then we started thinking through the, the practical, okay, here are the imperatives that God has given us and what do we need to do? How do we need to be obedient here? And we, we kind of thought through this whole ministry framework. And then I, I took this ministry framework to the elders and kind of presented it to them. And it was, it was very practical. It was, okay, we can do this, and we can have this fund, and we can have this Bible study, and we can have this ministry, and so forth. And I, I forgot <laughs> to give them the, the theological underpinnings first. And so I, I went in there with this, this ministry proposal, and I expected, you know, a standing ovation or you know, some sort of Daniel, you know, just kind of wiping tears of joy from their eyes is, how do we get this guy? He's amazing. It's just an associate pastor. Let's give him a church. Um, none, none of that happened though, all right? None of that happened. They, they, they had a lot of questions. They said, well, and they, and they started asking a lot of, and very good, reasonable questions to ask. And I stepped away from that meeting and I realized, you know what I did? I started with the, the practical. I started with the imperatives. I started with, hey, let's do, 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 do this without saying, okay, here, here's why. Here's who we are in Christ. Here's our understanding of what God would have us do and why he would have us do it. Here's, here's who God is. Here's who we are. And here are the truths about who we are. And here's how, here's, here's how we can do the things that God has called us to do. I'd forgotten about the indicatives, the statements of, of truth. And so we went back and laid out the theology, the, the scripture concerning who God would have us be and, or who we are in Christ. And there still wasn't a standing ovation. But the next uh, meeting, it was a very exciting meeting as we began this, this ministry. Now, our ministry to orphans, our ministry to orphans has obviously been a ministry that is, has shaped our church in very very profound ways, our, our ministry to the fatherless. And many of you are a part of it. And many of you have seen that this is, a, this is an incredibly 
difficult ministry. Many of you have been through horrendous aspects of how difficult this ministry is. And yet, God has been glorified through very difficult circumstances and very, very exciting circumstances. And I believe that by God's grace, one of the reasons that God has allowed this ministry to bring him glory is because we as a church were, under, were able, by God's grace again, to understand the theology behind this ministry, who God is, and we were understand theologically who we are, and we were able to understand a theology of suffering, and we were able to understand a theology of, of reward and what God is going to do for his children as we think about this moment we have in life and how we need to use this moment for his glory because of who we are in Christ. I believe that God blessed our ability by his grace to understand his truths to help us be obedient to the imperative and it's not, of course, just true in adoption ministry, right? It is essential for you to know who you are in Christ and the truths that are related to your adoption by God before you can be obedient to God. There is no area of obedience that you can fulfill the way that God has called you to fulfill without understanding who you are as his adopted children. What we're talking about this morning is foundational to, to, to you being able to be obedient in a God-glorifying way. There are some truths that you and I need to understand about who we are if we're going to be obedient rightly. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about the indicatives of our adoptions, of our adoption statements of truth about who you are in Christ as an adopted child that are going to help you, I think, be obedient. And then we're going to talk about imperatives, maybe just for a minute or two, and then we're going to talk about some implications, okay? So let's, let's dive into this. Let's begin by talking about the indicatives of our ad adoption. And these are three statements, and we could give more here, but three, three big statements that are indicatives, that are statements of truths about what God has done from this passage. And these are statements that honestly may not always feel true in your life, but we believe they're true because God says that the first truth is this, you and I are no longer enslaved. And look at verses one through three. Look what Paul writes. Paul says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Paul is saying we are no longer enslaved. Our slavery was, was past tense. And he imagines a scenario here where there's this, this young heir. And the heir in this, this, uh, this household, you have an heir, and he's essentially no different from a slave. So here's the heir, and here's a slave. And in one sense, both of them are equal because neither of them have access to the father's wealth. I think it was in 1999, there was this, this young Earl, and he, and he inherited like a million dollars or something from some uncle who passed away, and his uh, mom and dad, a duke and duchess, they were concerned about his access to this wealth, and so they went to court. I mean, this, this kid was going to be wealthy at, at some point in his life. I think he's the heir to the, um, to the Harry Potter castle in the movies or something. I mean, he's he's, he's going to do okay in life. But they said, look, he's too young right now. We don't want him receiving all of this, this money. And so they went to court to, to block his ability to receive these funds until he reached the age of, of 25 or something because everyone knows 25-year-olds are way more responsible, right? <laughs> so some of the 25-year-olds are going, uh, excuse me, right here. Um, I'm sure you're a very responsible 25-year-old. And the judge agreed. The judge said, yeah, this, this sounds like a bad idea for this young kid to get this much money this quickly. So we'll see you when you're 25. Paul says a similar scenario. Here's a young heir. The heir is no different from a slave. He's under guardians and managers until a time set by his father. And the word guardian there would refer to like a, a, a person who oversaw the education of a young, young man until he's say 14 or 15 years old. And, and a manager would have been a person who took him at 15 and kind of worked with him until he was 24 or 25 years old. And so Paul says, look, 
Here's a scenario, an heir, he's going to receive access to the wealth of the father, but there's a, there's a time where it may feel like he's enslaved because there's no difference between him and a slave because neither can have access to the wealth. Both of them are, are underneath the authority of others. A, a guardian who kind of tutors him and a, a, a manager who kind of handles funds until he reaches the age of 25. Now, once he turns 25, what is it? It's payday. And what 25-year-old who now has access to the father's wealth is going to say, you know what? I love the guardian days. Let's, let's go back to that. Where, let me find that guy who taught me my uh, ABCs, and let's just go back to those days when I didn't have access to the wealth. No, no, no person who acquires the inheritance and access to the father's wealth is going to go back to that. Paul gives us the implication in verse 3. He gives us, he says, here's the point. In the same way, here's, here's my point. <clears throat> we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. You say, well, what does that phrase, elementary principles, mean? And we're going to talk more about that next week. But essentially, here's what he's saying. Elementary principles can be a phrase that refers to a couple things. Sometimes it refers to like the the things that the universe was made of, the, the very basic things that the universe was made of. It could also mean like the very basic building blocks of knowledge. So for example, the, the alphabet. The alphabet would be like the, the elementary principles and you take those elementary principles and you, you learn how to read. You learn the sounds that the the letters make, and then you learn words, and then you learn sentences, and syntax, and grammar, and all those sorts of things. But, but the, the elementary principles, the, the tiniest building blocks are what? They're, they're, it's the alphabet. Now, what person, after learning the alphabet, and then learning the sounds that combinations of letters make, and then the words, and then learning how to, to read s sentences, and then learning uh, all the things that, you know, reading books and then graduating high school, what high school graduate is going to go back and say, you know what, um, I think I want to go back to kindergarten and just really, just really hone in on the ABCs. Those were good days. I'm going to go back, the coloring sheet and, and color the A and the lowercase. And the, I mean, there's a lower and an uppercase. Let's, let's go back and just really spend some time. Um, no one's going to do that, right? Paul says this. He says, in the same way we also, when we were children, so there's this time we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. There was, there was a, no person is going to go back, and, and he's, he's referring there, he's kind of giving the example of the law. No one's going to go back to a place where they need to go back to the, the foundational principles. And if you are a, a person who's received the gospel, going back to the law would be like going back to the, to the alphabet. It'd be like a, 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 a PhD student coming back and saying, I'm going to go back to kindergarten and learn the alphabet. You've received the, the fullness of, of the gospel. Now, again, next week we're going to talk more about enslavement and what that looks like. But, but just here's, here's the first indicative. Here's the first statement that you need to just wrap your mind around and, and, and rejoice in the goodness of this phrase. You and I are no longer enslaved. You're, you're no longer a slave. Jesus says this in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Galatians, later, Paul will write in chapter 5, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You've, you've been freed from the burden of the law and legalism. 1 John 5, 3 says, This is the, the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So in other words, last week we saw we're, we're in Christ and we talked about all the advantages that has, all the advantages we now have that we didn't have before. Why in the world would we continue to live in such a way that we acted like slaves? That we believed that we were underneath some, some burden of the law. We need to know who we are in Christ. And some of you would say, well, Daniel, as I think about my life, 
as I think about my relationship with other believers, as I think about how I live my life, I feel like I am a slave. I feel like I'm a slave to other people. I feel like I'm a slave to perfectionism. I feel like I'm a slave to these things. And, and I say, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's why you need the truths before you can focus on application. And what is the truth that God is telling you? Even though you may feel like a slave, you're not. We are no longer enslaved. And that brings us to the second truth that you and I need to grasp this morning by God's grace. We are adopted. We're adopted. Listen to what Paul writes next in verse 4 and verse 5. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, and remember the last uh, passage, the last couple of verses, the scenario is there's a, a time set by the father. There's, there's this, this date, this appointed time when, when the, the child will receive the inheritance or the, 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 the fullness of, of access to the father's resources. And verse four envisions that time coming to, to fruition. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So again, Paul envisions this scenario where there's a, a, a child and they receive adoption. And, and the, the, the adoption process in the Greco-Roman world was different than it is in our world, but there were some similarities as well. It was a, it was a difficult process. It was an expensive process. It was a legal process. It would, it would be involve some time. Money would exchange hands. A child would be brought in before this, this new adoptive father, maybe an older child or a young man, and, and the, the father, the new father, would, would publicly declare this person to be his son. There would be witnesses, and it would be a, a legally binding relationship now. There would be no ability for this new father to, to disown this new son. And if later the father died and some of the other heirs were upset and said, this guy isn't really one of our, us, he doesn't receive access to the inheritance, these seven witnesses could, could stand up in court and say, no, no, this, this person is this man's son. Be a moment when this all comes to fruition, and that's what Paul's envisioning here. There's there's this fullness of time, and God sends Jesus, born of woman, born of the law, for a purpose, to a purpose of redemption, so that we can receive this adoption. There's other passages that describe our adoption by God. Romans chapter eight. Paul says this. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 23. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now, this is an important truth for you to grasp because sometimes, if, if you're like me, it can be hard to grasp the reality that God has really called you his son or his daughter. I told this story at the conference, but a, a few weeks ago, uh, I was uh, walking in the church building and I, I heard someone calling my, my son, They're Austin. They go, Austin, Austin. And, and at, you know, a few years ago, you know, 10 years ago, I'd been much more worried if someone was calling Austin's name in the church building than I am now. But there's still, there's still a little bit of a, oh, 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 you know, is, is my kid in a little bit of trouble? And then the, the tone of the voice changed to kind of like a, uh, a little bit more perplexed, you know, like there, there was greater concern in the voice as the name was being called. I'm like, oh man, why is he not answering her? And I, I turned around to kind of say, you know, listen, and I realized she was talking to me, thinking that I was Austin. And, you know, I'm both, oh, sorry. Um, I know we're both very good looking, very cool. <laughs> Classy walks, you know, but, um, you know, so we laughed, right? 
No one ever, uh, no one ever sees me in Austin next to one another and says, ah, I'm not seeing it. Not, I'm not sure if that's really your son, right? Same with my, Noah. You know, Noah and I and, and Austin, you know, people kind of see it a little bit. But my daughters, may, maybe not always. Now, if they're talking to my daughters and hearing the sarcasm, then, then yes. But, you know, just kind of looking, maybe, maybe, maybe not always as, as readily avail, you know, noticeable if people don't know us that, okay, th- those are his, his daughters. And yet, my daughters are every bit my, my children as my sons are, right? But if, if one of my daughters were to, to struggle with, with, and I hope that they don't, but if they were to struggle with, with knowing, okay, am I, am I really my dad's? Does dad really love me? Then, then, this, then, then the truth of my love for them would be something I need to convey. And it would be, it would be something that I would be passionate. I, you need to know this. You need to know how, how deeply I love you and how much you are my child and that nothing could ever change that. And the same is true for you and I in relationship with God. God desires that you, before you begin obeying, before you begin, you know, adopting kids or going on the mission field or doing all these things you think God wants you to do, you you need to know the, the indicative, the, the statement of, of truth first. Look, you are my child. I've brought you into relationship with me. You are my a child through adoption, through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, and nothing you can do will, will change that. Now, if it's true that we're now in this relationship, there's going to be fr- some fruit from that. We'll, we'll talk about that, but you need to know, who are you? Who are you? Foundationally, you're, you're, you're my child, not through your works. A, a child in the Greco-Roman world didn't, didn't earn an adoptive father's love or standing that the father did the redemptive work. The father brought the, the son into the relationship, and the same is true with God. Now that brings us, that brings us to the, the third kind of statement of truth here that I think is helpful for us to think about. Number three, we receive all the blessings of being children of God. You and I, because we're adopted by God, no longer slaves, because we've been adopted by God, we receive all the blessings of being children of God. Listen to this amazing thing that Paul writes, these these beautiful words. He says, and and because, so, um, so think about the logical progression here. Uh, We used to be enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born in the law, to redeem those who are in the law so we might receive adoption as sons. And now because of that, so this is all, all building on itself logically, because your sons, so it's a statement of truth, you may not feel like sons, you may not feel like daughters, but it's happened if you've been united with God through faith in Jesus Christ by God's grace. If you're now in Christ, your sons, your daughters, because that's happened, here's, here's some other things that may not always feel true about you, but are. Because your sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. Now just let that soak in for a moment. What are some of the results of being adopted by God? What, what happens because of that? Just, let's just think about a couple things. We could talk about many more. Let's, let's just talk about a couple things. What, what do we see there? We see that you and I are now indwelled by the Spirit. See that? He says, because of our adoption, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, and and through the Spirit, we're able to cry out, Abba, Father. So what does it mean to be indwelled by the Spirit? It means that we've now been empowered to obey. It means that we now, it's not the law that's causing obedience. We're being obedient as, as children, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says he's put a seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And he continues, God continues his work in our lives in, in numerous ways. The spirit's indwelling ministry is a fulfillment of Jesus' promise to give us a helper who will be with us forever. John chapter 14 verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever forever. 
Romans 8, chapter 11 promises us that the indwelling Holy Spirit will continue to sanctify us. He says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, you just meditate on that truth. Who am I? I'm an adopted child of God. What does that mean? It means I have the spirit. What does that mean? It means there's a spirit right now. The same spirit who, who raised Jesus from the dead is now working in me changing me and transforming me and continuing to sanctify me. It means that the Holy Spirit is going to convict me of sin. John chapter 16, Jesus says, when he comes, the Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Spirit enables us to understand God's word as we read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from the Father. That we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. He gives assurance to us. In fact, maybe even as I'm speaking right now, some of you are children of God. And you're struggling with assurance, with, with knowing, am I a child of God? The Spirit of God dwells within you. If you truly have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit gives you assurance, Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He fills us with himself. Ephesians 5, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. We receive all the blessings of being children of God. And one of those blessings is the, the indwelling work of the Spirit. Another blessing of, of, of being a child of God we see here in this verse is, is that, we, that we what? That we have fellowship with God. He says, he says um, we, we now cry, Abba, Father. And that, that phrase there is, is a phrase that a young a child could say to their, their father. It's a, it's a term of familiarity. It's a term that you use within the context of a family relationship. It's a phrase that we couldn't use just in formal conversation just with another person. Now there's, there's this relationship. So one of the blessings of being with God is that we, being children of God, is that we are indwelled by the Spirit. Another blessing is that we have fellowship with God. There's, there's, there, we're now part of a family that we were not part of before. When I was growing up, um, in the evenings, afternoons, a lot of times my friends would come over to our house. And I, I had friends who really wanted to be a part of our family. Right? They, they saw that we had a, a really happy family. We enjoyed doing things together. My dad, it didn't matter who was over in the evenings. Uh, my dad would just say, okay, we're going to do uh, devotional time now or quiet time now. And we just open up the Bible. We read it together with our family and whoever else was there and pray together. And, and, and a lot of my friends just found that. You know, even my friends who weren't believers just found that really something attractive about that and wanted to be a part of, of, that, of that moment. But as much as we loved my friends, that they weren't part of the family, right? I mean, they, they were still outside. My family, my immediate family, we enjoy our relationship with, with one another. In fact, we, uh, we do this thing when the, when the kids turn 15 where we kind of go off and we just kind of spend some time together. And, and we, uh, every time we kind of write down, hey, what are, the, what are our goals and what does it mean for us to, to be a part of a family? And here's some of the things that my kids have written over the years about what it means to be a Bennett and some of the goals that we have for our family. So to be a Bennett uh, means to love God. It means to love one another. It means to uh, be hardworking, to be... The, and now, let me just... These are aspirational, okay? I mean, these are, these are not uh, testimonial of truths that have already necessarily happened, okay? Uh, certainly not perfectly. Um, we, we, we're to be a bit, it means to be patient with each other, to be selfless, to be helpful, truthful. It sounds like a Boy Scout a little bit. Uh, hospitable, to enjoy superhero movies, uh, 
not all the girls agreed with that one, uh, to like chocolate, to go on uh, outings with dad on Thursdays, to be kind to each other, long-term goals, to care for each other, to increase our ministry to our neighbors, to plan some family trips, to stay close even when we start to move out, to go on a mission trip together, to eat food from every continent, to visit the DC Comics headquarters, <laughs> to get baptized in the Jordan River, and uh, someone wrote, eat a shark. That was another <laughs> goal that we had, okay. Now, um, I, I love each of you here, but if, if you're not uh, part of our family, you're, 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 not, you're not part of that list. It's a very exclusive club, right? And, and here, to have fellowship with God, you can't just say, you know what, I like God, I, I enjoy, I, I want I just be in a relationship. You have to be brought into that relationship. And we have fellowship with God where we can call it Abba, Father, in a way that no one else can. It's a beautiful truth. It also means another blessing that we receive is to be an heir with God. He, 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 says, he says, because your sons, your heirs, and we receive, and we talked about this before, we receive all the, the blessings of, of being an heir being in line of, of all the f access to all the Father's wealth and blessing. You, you've, been, you've been adopted, you've been it's like you've been born into to blessing. And you receive all the, the, the benefits of being a part of God's family, all the, all the benefits you could receive. I, I had a friend in high school, her, her grandfather, she has a story about her grandfather who was Mexican and he, um, he used to, to sneak across the border, swim across the, the river uh, every, every day, every couple days to work in the United States and, and in Texas and then would sneak back. He didn't tell his parents what he was doing because he knew that if they found out, he would be in so much trouble because what he was doing was so dangerous. But one day that he was discovered and his parents sat him down. They said, look, first of all, what you're doing is, is dangerous. Second of all, what you're doing is, is wrong. Second of all, what you're doing is, is foolish because you're an American citizen. And he goes, what? He goes, yeah, you were born in America. You're an American citizen. You don't have to sneak across the border. You just walk up. He goes, oh, that's helpful to know, right? <laughs> now, did his knowledge, did his knowledge change the reality of who he was? No. He was an American citizen whether he, he knew it and acted like it or not. Same is true for you and me. Our, our knowledge doesn't change who we are, but, but knowing who we are affects how we act. And some of us are, are trying to do things in obedience to God without recognizing who we are as his children already. We receive all the blessings. You don't have to, to go on a mission trip. You don't have to, to um, sacrifice your, your very life to receive God's love for you. You've already gotten it. Now go sacrifice your life as, as his child but not out of a desire to somehow win his approval. We look at the, the, we look at the imperatives and, and instructions of Scripture, not as slaves who must do as our master commands in order to win his favor. We approach the imperatives, the commands, as beloved sons and daughters who express holiness, devotion, as we imitate our loving Heavenly Father. Let's, um, let's talk about the imperatives of our adoption. There are some. God tells us to do things. Let's go on to the next point, number three, the implications of our adoption. I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek here, but you know there are imperatives. You know that God gives us commands to do. That's, we're going to talk more about that as we go through Galatians. That's not what I'm going to focus on today. Let's, let's talk about the implications. Number one, the gospel shapes my understanding of the purpose of ministry. So in other words, as I understand who I am as an adopted child, but the good news of my adoption, the gospel shapes my understanding of the purpose of ministry. I, I need to carefully think through why am I doing the things that God has called me to do? Why am I adopting children? Why am I serving in children's ministry? Why am I going uh, to, to um, my neighbor's house and sharing the gospel? Why am I, I doing these, these things? Why am I doing these things? It's not to, to prove my worth. It's not out of guilt. It's it's not out of lack of satisfaction. It's not to glorify myself, but to glorify God. As I think about what, as I think about what He has done for me in adopting me, it shapes my understanding of why I do the things that I do. He's He's done all the work. There's there's no more blessing that I can earn or deserve in of myself. I do these things as His child to glorify Him. 
Secondly, the gospel shapes my understanding of, of the fuel of ministry. The gospel shapes my understanding of, of the fuel of ministry. I need to think carefully through how am I going to do this ministry? God has, has told me there's these things that I, I need to do, and if I just begin to do those things without realizing who I am in Christ, I can, I can run out of fuel. I can become discouraged. Thinking through who I am in Christ and how I can do this ministry encourages me because I, I, I can be tempted to gauge success in how well I'm fulfilling other people's purposes for me instead of saying, okay, am I fulfilling God's purpose? And saying, okay, um, th this ministry isn't going the way that I would envision it. This, this ministry isn't going the way that maybe other people in the world would, would see success, but I'm being obedient to God and, and I'm, I'm fulfilling my purpose, and that continues to fuel my obedience for God as I pursue the things that he's called me to do. And then the last thing about the gospel here, the gospel shapes my understanding of the nature of ministry. The gospel, seeing the good news of me being an adopted child of God, shapes my understanding of, of the nature of ministry. I'm thinking carefully through, okay, I, now I know who I am. I know the good news of my adoption by God. Now, now what am I going to do as a result? What am I going to do in the ministry that, that God has called me to do? God desires me to do these good works. Ephesians 2.10, he's, he's prepared good works for me, eternity past for me to do. I know I need to share the gospel with my coworker. I know I, know I need to, to um, honor God in my dating relationship as a, a single person. I know that I need to avoid lust as, as, a, as, a, as a person who needs to be obedient to God. I know that I need to use the, the physical resources that God has given me in obedience to him, but those things are so hard. Being obedient is, is so difficult if I'm doing it on my own strength. God has called me to do these good works, these imperatives, but I do them not on my own, but through Christ who works within me. And I ask God, God, help me understand the, the nature of the things that you want me to do. I, I'm here and, and you've, I'm your child and I, I'm, I'm gonna do these ministries not because other people are pressuring me, not because I'm trying to somehow earn your favor, but because I believe that you as a loving father have prepared works for me to do from eternity past. Now, help me to do them in your strength. Because of our union with the Son, because of our union with the Son, Jesus Christ, through adoption, we have the ability to be obedient to and imitate our Heavenly Father.